Thanks for joining us today. I'm Brandon West. I lead the AWS Technical Evangelism Team for the Americas region. And I'm joined by Mark. Hi there. Hi. Good to be here. Uh, do you mind introducing yourself? I'll do Tell that. the viewers who yeah, you are. So uh, I work in our security organization for our CISO, Steve Schmidt. I'm uh, director of the office of the chief information security officer. Cool. Sounds like uh, a difficult job. Oh, I get to do all kinds of fun stuff, including this, which is uh, one of my hobbies, Nitro Security. Cool. Yeah, this is, this is super interesting to me because I've learned a little bit about what Nitro is. Yeah. And I'm really interested to learn more because it seems like such a cool fundamental piece of how we offer compute and many other services. Yeah, absolutely. We, we launched it at reInvent a year and a half ago, and there were a couple talks to your, your, that at that point, and then another talk last. So we've been getting the information out about how we've sort of decomposed traditional virtualization into these hardware software components that allow us to do some really cool things, but we hadn't ever really made the sort of security spin on that story. So this conference is, is an opportunity to take information that's kind of out there but hasn't been coalesced mm -hmm. into like, here's the security perspective. Um, and I'll give a talk tomorrow to talk about this uh, in depth. Yeah, it, it seems very interesting. The, let's set the stage for the audience right now. Sure. Let's talk a little bit about some definitions, right? So we've got EC2 Nitro Security. Yeah. Uh, start with EC2, right? Okay. Hopefully everyone is familiar with it, but it's one of the foundational services of Absolutely. AWS, right? It's, yep. I guess, the, the server full compute, not the yes. serverless compute. Yeah, so, in the end, there are servers somewhere doing some stuff, and yes. uh, EC2 is that very foundational technology where we can build other cool things like containers and Lambda and all that, all running fundamentally on EC2. And actually over time, there'll be more and more of our services run on EC2. So EC2 is becoming even a building block for uh, the, s the services we provide to customers too. So, so EC2 runs virtual machines right. on top of host machines. Yeah. And there's a thing called a hypervisor that manages how all these VMs work, yeah. how they get assets assigned from that host machine, how resources are distributed, how you carve it up, basically. Yep. So Nitro, for us, is our hardware-based, custom-designed hypervisor. Is that accurate? Uh, let's call it a system, because in okay. some cases, there is no hypervisor. Okay. Or the so-called bare metal instances. I don't say so-called. They are actually they are. bare metal instances. But what's happened in Nitro is we're able to provide you with a bare metal with the full Intel processor and memory and associated capabilities because we've removed some core things that used to be done by hypervisors and put them into dedicated hardware software components Got that it. run in the same physical box. Okay, so before where you had to have this hypervisor running on that host machine, that was consuming resources itself to manage right. the state of the virtual machines. Now we've offloaded that to a separate piece of hardware so that when yep. people spin up their EC2 instances, they get the full capability of what they've paid for. That's right. In most cases, people will still use a hypervisor because these are hefty machines. There are tons of cores and tons of memory, relatively expensive, and bare metal has its use cases, but the vast majority of our customers will still use hypervised scenarios, but the difference is that in this case, this hypervisor is super small and simple because all it does is divide up CPU and memory uh, and set up connections over the PCI bus to I.O. devices, and then it just kind of goes to sleep and, and uh, you know, is there for the sort of creating the security boundaries, but doesn't actually do a lot of the work that used to be done in this special copy of an operating system, which was called DOM0. So in Zen terminology, okay. every, whether it's you know, Hyper-V, VMware, Zen, they all have a copy of an operating system running as a privileged thing, which created what was called a device model. All our viewers know what a horror device drivers are, right? Like getting your device drivers to work with a million different things. And so the makers of hypervisors said, well, we're not going to bother with that. We're going to have a privileged operating system that will mediate all access to those billions of things out there which need device drivers, and then that privileged operating system will expose the virtual de de devices to all the guest, the guest VMs. So that was a way to make it so that hypervisors weren't super complicated with millions of device drivers that they had to, to manage. But it had the disadvantage that you've got a full copy of an operating system running on that same host, taking CPU, taking memory, um, and also, it's just kind of a big, complicated piece of software, which isn't yeah. really that great from a security perspective. You really want you know, minimalistic kinds of things to be most secure. So with Nitro, what we've done is said, okay, if we can take all the software that used to run in that DOM0 and all those driver device models and move that off the main processor board, 
then our hypervisor can just be super thin and minimalistic and just allocate memory and CPU and respond to privileged instructions. But otherwise, all the work is done by other computers yeah. in that same host with specialized hardware and software that we built, which we call the Nitro system. Okay. And one, one thing that I think is super cool about this is it's actually custom designed silicon, right? Yeah. It's, we acquired a company called Annapurna. That's right. And they built this for us. So it's, it's, a, it's an ASIC, right? It's an application specific integrated circuit. Yep. So designed completely just to do this one task. So that's part of how we're able to offer yep. EC2 instances at such low cost because we're, we have these economies of scale that let us do Absolutely. stuff like custom designed silicon, which I don't know of many people running on-premises data centers that are designing their own hardware. Yeah, the a uh, acquisition of Annapurna Labs was a, was a real milestone because we'd actually work with them as a supplier for an, er an earlier EC2 instance where we wanted to offload some things. They, they were the first vendor out there that would enable you to do to express an, an NVMe device, which looks like a local SSD drive, but they, they had a special processor that was actually emulating that. And that's where we first offloaded EBS processing to their, their processor card. But once we work with them and realize their abilities and capabilities, and we knew that going forward, we want to have a lot of custom hardware software combinations, mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was a great step forward to just say, you know what? Become our in-house, you know, fabulous design firm. Yeah. And now, they, now, a lot of these systems, to, to be clear, they still have a general purpose processor. They have ARM, multi-core ARM processors for kind of general software. But they can also build those custom ASICs when necessary to do that special acceleration. Like, for example, we do a lot of encryption offload in these devices because a lot of what they're doing is giving you full line rate encryption at super high rates. And encryption is a great thing to build into hardware uh, yeah. to make it really fast. Yeah, and so some of those announcements that we heard yeah. uh, from the reinforced keynote, we're talking about um, how how we can um, essentially, uh, sorry, I'm, the, the <laughs> train just left the station there. Uh, <laughs> well, run, I mean, let's, let's talk about three major I.O. devices in, these new nitro, in, the, in the Nitro system. You have EBS, you have uh, local, what's called instant storage, and you have VPC, so your, your network. All three of those major I.O. subsystems now run special hardware and software, which do the bulk of the work, including all the encryption. So the encryption keys for EBS, we just announced uh, recently that you can now have an account-wide flag that just says, encrypt all my EBS volumes, full mm -hmm. stop, right? No, no IAM policies, none of the more complex ways of doing that we had before. Well, in the Nitro systems, the, it's, the EB, it's the Nitro card that interacts with KMS, gets a, a copy of a data key encrypted, an unencrypted copy over TLS, pulls it in, keeps the unencrypted copy for actual line rate encryption, but also stores an encrypted copy of the data key with the volume, and that way the volume and the instance can have different lifetimes. Okay. Um, but all of that work is being done in a coprocessor, or just another computer. Um, the reason I hesitate to call them coprocessors is because now the Nitro computers are sort of in charge of the whole system, and you could almost say that the main board with the Intel or AMD processor is the coprocessor yeah. of customer workloads, yeah. right? But that's not as trusted as these Nitro systems, which securely boot the system, main, maintain system integrity, scan the firmware to make sure it's safe. All those things you would want to do to maintain a highly secure system is done by the Nitro system, and then eventually software comes up on the main board, um, but that's the less trusted part of these, of these devices. So I, that's what make, whenever I start to call the Nitro's cards coprocessors, I feel kind of funny. It's like, no, eh, they're kind of like, in some ways, the main processors yeah. on these systems, but, yeah. but they do these specialized offload tasks, including line rate encryption of EBS, line rate encryption of instance storage, even like an i3 instance, which has millions of IOPS and can do you know, ter uh, megabits per second of IO to local storage, is encrypting every single one of those packets before it writes it to local storage. And that's Got all it. done in these accelerators. So this, this is how we're able to offer that encryption by default, but still provide the guaranteed throughput right. that we've said you're going to get. And the thing we mentioned today that was in the keynote and then uh, Colm gave a talk uh, uh, about uh, encryption features. So in our uh, most advanced instance types, they're the N families. They have the latest, most powerful networking capability, 100 gigabit per second networking. Mm -hmm. They also have a m sufficiently powerful Nitro processor that they can actually encrypt all the traffic at 100 gigabits per wow. second. So now, just by default, you don't have to do anything. Whenever an in instance type is talking to another in instance type, they recognize that fact, and they encrypt everything in between them, even if they're in the same rack, much less the same data center. So 
to get that kind of performance, you have to have dedicated hardware. So we can't have like a big bang upgrade where like everything's encrypted in a data center. Mm -hmm. um, but over time and pretty rapidly, we'll begin aging in the newest generations of hardware and within a year or two, most of the traffic you'll see in an EC2 environment will be encrypted all the time, regardless of any customer making a decision about Great. it or not. J just in time for the launch of some quantum computing service <laughs> to come along and exactly. crack all of those, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, I think we're still a few years away from that. <laughs> uh, cool, so that's, that's sort of uh, the encryption side of yep. security, talking about storing data at rest and in motion and how Nitro can help with both of those things. Right. What are some of the other security things that are enabled by using Nitro? Well, I mentioned one already, but it's just a nice defense in depth. So normally the hypervisor protects um, a virtual machine service from the guest operating systems doing something directly to the hardware. You try to update the firmware, that's an illegal instruction, You'll, you know, it'll just fail. Uh, there's various other things you can do, but you know, it's possible that hypervisors could have bugs in them, so it would really be nice if you kind of knew that the firmware was protected even if there wasn't a hypervisor. And by the fact that we've launched these bare metal types, we've built the protections now into the fundamental hardware platform so that the Nitro controller, um, every time it allocates a new, an instance and boots it basically for bare metal, that would be basically rebooting between customers, or in the case of non-bare metal, every time the system boots, what the, what the Nitro card does is it goes and it scans all the firmware on the motherboard and says, does this hash of this firmware match a valid known good configuration? If it doesn't, it throws an alarm and says, you know, mm -hmm. sorry, I'm not available. Um, which has never happened, <laughs> yeah, keep your fingers crossed, except in test mode. Yep. Um, but we do have that, that ability to detect any tampering with the hardware by using another root, root of trust that's not the main board um, and the main processor. Now there are things like trusted compute within typical motherboards, but they're really complicated pieces of hardware and software BIOS and TPMs and Intel chips and all these different things that have to cooperate for that to get the equivalent of like a secure boot. And we're able to really like isolate that off to a much simpler system that we control everything top to bottom, software and hardware, and use that to verify the integrity of the, the main systems. Um, and those little Nitro controllers, they boot off a little, a little um, humble um, SATA drive <laughs> that's physically <laughs> in that box and it just all it does is boot the Nitro controller and then it huh. goes, goes away. So, um, so there's like no way for that to be tampered with from the main system. Uh, so we built a lot of checks and controls in to make, you know, for s secure um, integrity. And then uh, the next thing I would mention as well is we built the system in a way such that um, they're what, what are called passive systems. So like when we want to talk to a Nitro system, uh, the control plane always reaches out to the to the Nitro card. So it's 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 always it's listening on the network, but it's not proactively reaching out on the network. So. We constantly check it. We, we health check it. We check it for CloudWatch metrics. We, you know, if we send it an API call saying, hey, create a new EBS volume, that will happen. But what's not happening is that code on the Nitro processor is not proactively going out to the network and doing things, kind of initiating things, which is a really good security property. Because if we ever see initiation of any traffic from that device, we're like, ah, uh, there's something wrong here, and we can deal with that very effectively. And similarly, the hypervisor itself, sitting, sitting on that main board, it doesn't have access to the, to the EC2 privilege network. It literally has to go through the Nitro processor to get to the network. And so there's no way for even bad software on the motherboard uh, to actually reach out except inside VPC encapsulation. So like, you can be inside your VPC, okay, right. then, you, then you have VPC full logs, you've got traffic mirroring, you've got other ways of dealing with potentially bad things happening but you're never going to get out to that core uh, trusted substrate, which is really a, a very cool property of these systems. Yeah, that's, that's extremely cool. So basically, the, the internal EC2 network is completely protected from anything that might happen in user space. Yeah, yeah, or in kernel space. Of or in these, kernel space. Yeah, of these, of these uh, hosts with these special properties, yeah. Very, very cool. <clears throat> and of course, we built Firecracker on top of the bare metal instance type, right? Because now we have, you're fully inside of EC2. You have CloudWatch metrics, you've got instance metadata service, you've got VPC, EBS, all those features, but you're a bare metal thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's a great platform for our micro VMs, which we've launched for Firecracker, where we can have super fast boots, super uh, dynamic VM environments, but um, running on bare metal, high, super high performance, not having to do layered, um, layered hypervising, which is inefficient, um, but yet still being a fully controlled EC2 instance. So it's been a win. So 
Firecracker is also one of those things that's super interesting to me. Yeah. I, I, is there some origin story that, of Nitro and Firecracker that's intertwined at all that you can tell us a tale about? Well, I think you know, the rise of containerization and Lambda you know, quickly made clear to us that we, while we need the, the strong isolation properties of full virtualization, uh, we had to make up a way to do that that was really fast and really inexpensive to start and stop and you know, very simple device models and mm -hmm. so forth. So you know, the goal was, can we create VM technology that's literally as fast as containers? And that's what Firecracker enables. And so it's really the, the need to, to run um, you know, containers and Lambda type functions um, with, with full tenant isolation. And we can even go beyond that um, with, like Lambda, we can actually isolate at the function level, right? So you can have seven different functions and each one of those will run in a separate v micro VM. So you get, you get even better security properties than using EC2 boundaries. So it was a really good decision from the start to always use VM isolation for customers to separate them. Um, but we also knew that it, there was a lot of inefficiency because sometimes these functions just last a few milliseconds and you to have like VMs, full blown VMs sitting around waiting for that kind of you know, occasional invocation is just not super efficient. So, yeah. um, micro, so Firecracker is a nice bridge between the traditional virtualization and then the future of you know, function as a service and containerization. Cool. One of my favorite things about Firecracker also is that it's open source. Right? Yeah. It's, you, can, you can dig into it and play around with spinning up your own uh, micro VMs if you want to. Um, yeah. Not something I'm personally interested <laughs> in. I'd much rather pay someone that's good at all of this uh, security of the cloud stuff that we've been talking about. Because yeah. as you can tell, it's a lot. It's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, and it's a ton of focus on security. Those of you go look at deeply at that open source project, you'll notice some funny things like, the, uh, the name of the virtual machine monitor. So it uses KVM primitives and creates a VM, but there's a process running there kind of managing that VM, and the process is called jailer. <laughs> okay, yeah. why is that? Well, because we want very good isolation. Yeah. Um, so it uses some really cool features. Of, of even within SC Linux, you have isolation features, and the actual container or Lambda still runs in a container inside a copy of Linux inside, you know, uh, managed by this, this mic managed by the micro VM. So it's a very uh, security focused but super efficient model. And then if you go far enough, you eventually hit the simulation that we're running in, and then <laughs> that's the VM right. that's running that exactly. simulation. No. <laughs> layer upon layer <laughs> upon layer. Yeah. It's <laughs> VMs all the way down, right? That's right. Uh, Great. Well, this has been super enlightening for me. I've learned a ton about Good, Nitro, yeah, about really what it is, about how it helps inform our security posture at AWS. We have a few minutes left. Is there anything else about Nitro that is just a super fun fact you want to share or something you think our audience might like to Well, I think if you like step know? back from, I mean, you said a lot of these cool details, but if you step back, what you, you really see is we've applied like a microservices architecture to hardware design. Because each of these components has separate pieces of software, separate hardware, they're built by separate teams, they can be deployed in different ways. They're like building blocks at the hardware software level mm -hmm. that can be composed into actual running hosts or systems. And, uh, and we had separation of duties, like one team doesn't have the right to call certain APIs that other teams can, you know, their code can. So you get uh, basically the micro segmentation, micro architecture, micro services pushed down into the actual design of the hardware with many of the same benefits. Like I can, I can ship features every two weeks and you can be every four weeks and it doesn't matter because as long as we meet these contracts. Now in this case, sometimes the contracts, instead of being like API software contracts, they're hardware command contracts. Like, hey, I look like an NVMe controller on the, on the system bus. I look just like an SSD drive. Are you an SSD drive? No, I'm an EBS thing. Yeah. But I met the contract. I, I, you send me NVMe commands, I do data storage for you. That's awesome, you know, so we've separated out those things into these components and the ability now to recompose and rejigger things and create new things out of these building blocks will enable us to be more innovative and move forward much more rapidly. Should new instance types more rapidly, et cetera, so yeah, really it's exciting. Super cool. It's, so many things always end up reminding me of the Unix philosophy, right? Have a piece of code that does one thing well. Yep. If you need to do another thing, create a new program. Don't extend the existing code. And then create common interfaces that everything can communi communicate but Right. through, right. and feels like and keep this. Keep those API contracts, right? Yes, exactly. Don't, don't constantly change your binary or other interface, right? So, yeah. yeah. Cool, I, I hadn't yet thought of that model applied to hardware, but I like it. Yeah, right on. good stuff. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Great I had a great here. time chatting with you. Hope everyone out there enjoyed it as well. Yeah, thanks, thanks for everyone. watching. Take care.